Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Images in Focus show. My name is David Swindler, and with me is my good friend, Juan Pons. How's it going, Juan? I'm doing great, David. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great as well. So excited to be here again. And this time we're going to be talking about wildlife photography. And on this episode, which is going to be the first of a multi-part series, we're going to talk about the foundational settings that you need to be successful in your wildlife photography. And these are questions that we get asked all the time as instructors in the field. You know, people need to know, well, what shutter speed should I be using? What aperture should I have the camera set at? What ISO should I be shooting? You know, all these things matter so much to that end result that you get coming out of the camera. Now, these are basic settings. We understand that. But their application in the field is actually quite complex. And you have to have a very solid understanding of what's going on with both your subject, the animal that you're shooting, and also the light that you have available to you and the artistic or end result that you're going after with the particular shot you're shooting. I mean, you're so, you're so, you're so right, David, in that, you know, these are, it sounds like pretty basic things, things that you need to know as when you're beginning photographer, like photography 101. But the point here is, is that these are things that you need to have a solid understanding on. When you're out in the field and you're in front of a, an elusive subject, you got to make sure that these things are kind of automatic in your head, that they just, you know, you understand them, you don't have to think about them, you kind of react instinctively um, by setting these, you know, uh, the correct settings for the particular situation you're in. You want to spend as much as you can of that particular situation in focusing on your subject, focusing on your composition, focusing on your perspective between yourself, your subject, and its background. It's not the time to be thinking, hmm, should I be using, you know, uh, a fast shutter speed or should I be using a small aperture or whatnot? Those things just need to be uh, completely automatic. Exactly. And that's why we're going to cover these things in, during this episode so we can kind of get you thinking about, the, about these settings so you can be prepared when you're out there in the field. The other thing that we're going to throw out, too, is that, you know, you need to be practicing ahead of time. And that's where you want to go out, you know, whether it be a bird feeder in your backyard or just going to the city park and photographing some ducks at the edge of the lake. You know, just get out there and really make this automatic. You know, David, so that's one of the things I always tell people is, you know, professional, photo uh, professional um, athletes and professional musicians, they're practicing all of the time, right? I mean, you see this. They go practice every single time. Musicians practice for hours every single day. You cannot expect to, you know, pick up your camera three or four times a year and go out on that once in a lifetime trip and be on top form to capture those animals. You need to be able to practice so that, you know, when you're going out there, that camera becomes an extension of yourself. It doesn't be, be, you know, seem like a foreign object. You mentioned going to the city park. The other place I kind of recommend people going to, um, and it's kind of weird, but, um, but it, it's very effective, is going to a big parking lot at a, you know, one of the big box stores or even a fast food restaurant, and you'll probably, just about anywhere in the country, you'll find a lot of seagulls there. Seagulls are great subjects to photograph with because, or practice with, because they're very fast-moving subjects. So if you can hone your skills um, photographing seagulls in a situation like that, you will be well-prepared to just about any situation. Exactly. So practice, practice, practice. Don't wait till the day of your trip to be like, oh, well, maybe I should go uh, figure out these settings again, uh, especially if it's been a while since you picked up that camera. The other thing that I'm going to throw out there, too, is that these foundational settings we're going to discuss, uh, screwing these things up is the fastest way to really screw up your shot. Too. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to take a bunch of shots that you just have to end up uh, delegating to the junk f file. You know, we want these to be shots that are sharp, uh, captivating, and convey the artistic uh, potential that you're after. Well, I mean, additionally, we're spending all this time, effort, money, resources to go to these incredible locations to photograph these animals, right? It's mm -hmm. not just about deleting the images, but you kind of, you know, not necessarily ruin your trip because there's an experience perspective of the trip. But, you know, if our goal is to make good images, you know, the trip would not have been as successful if you were not in top form when you get out there. Exactly. 
And so, you know, I'd like to start off talking a little bit about shutter speed. That's probably the one of the top questions I get is what does the shutter speed need to be need to be for this particular subject I'm shooting? And so let me kind of go into this. I kind of just put a little summary together to help you understand how I think about shutter speed. Uh, first of all, with a lot of my wildlife shots, I tend to handhold because hand holding gives me the flexibility to move around, to get low to the ground, or to kind of follow an animal as it's moving uh, around. And so if I'm hand holding, my rule of thumb is I need to be one over the focal length in shutter speed. So if I'm shooting a 500 millimeter lens, then I need to be one 500th of a second in shutter speed. If I'm shooting a 200 millimeter lens, then I need to be one 200th of a second in shutter speed. Now, let's say the light is really low, which tends to happen often, you know, if it's before sunrise or if it's getting, uh, it's dusk, you know, and the light's fading, or if I'm in a dark forest canopy. In that case, I may want to go below that hand holding theoretical minimum. So if I have image stabilizer or vibration reduction on my lens, I can theoretically go below that uh, anywhere from two to three stops. Now, generally, I would not recommend going like a full three stops below it because you're running into uh, risky, what I call risky territory, where if it doesn't work out, you could end up with a very blurry shot. So, you know, going one to two stops below can be just fine. So if I'm shooting this 500 millimeter lens, I could go one stop below that uh, minimum and shoot one two fiftieth of a second or two stops below that and go one one twenty fifth of a second. Now, the same thing would hold true if I have the camera stabilized on a tripod, but I'm still hand firing my shots and moving things around. Again, you know, you can do that two stops below the theoretical um, minimum, just knowing that a, I might get some motion blur, or B, I might get some handshake blur as a result if the IS or the VR doesn't work perfectly. Uh, Juan, do you have anything to add along those lines? No, I mean, I think you, I think you got it right. I think that uh, more and more, and this is a discussion we're going to have on a future part to this series of wildlife photography, um, but more and more, I know you and myself find ourselves shooting more handheld than anything. Um, because that keeps us light, quick, and nimble, right? Um, yes, not having exactly. to set up a tripod, not have to set up a gimbal, not having to use these humongously heavy and expensive 500, 600 millimeter lenses, you know, at, at f4 uh, makes us a lot more nimble. So we find ourselves shooting handheld most of the time. So it's really important to keep a tab on that shutter speed to make sure you are at the minimum, which is that one over the one over rule right yes. um mm -hmm. but you know even though people say well i have vibration reduction you know i have image stabilization and i have ibis or in body image stabilization i should be able to go to three stops below that you know to me i don't subscribe to that in most 99 percent of the time yes there are exceptions to this we're going to talk about that but 99 percent of the time i want to be at you know, that one over rule. And oftentimes I want to be even higher than that because I want to increase those numbers of sharp images. So um, yes. very, very important to keep tabs of that one over rule. And, you know, I'm surprised, David, because I see this all the time, how few people really understand that one over rule, right? Oh, I know. Very few people in the field actually seem to understand it. And, you know, I, I'll be shooting with a group of people and they'll have a long telephoto lens on and now I can audibly hear how slow their shutter speed yes. is I'm like, well, that's like sounds like one thirtieth of a second or one fortieth right. of a second and here they are at 300 millimeter yes. so i have to quickly tell them hey you need to um shoot much faster let's raise that iso let's open up that aperture you know no, yeah, you, i see that all it's so funny that you mentioned that because i see that quite often in that you, you hear that dunk and you're like, yeah. wait a second, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> Folks, yeah. you need to up that shutter speed to make sure you capture the image. So, <laughs> Yeah, and the last thing you want to do is get home and have just a bunch of blurry images because you're shooting too slow of a shutter speed. Right, you know, and, and you know, this is actually um, a good time maybe to talk about one of the reasons why, you know, for example, I know that 
um, you, like me, tend to shoot in aperture priority most of the time, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there's a number of reasons for that. We can get, we, I'm sure we'll touch upon those, you know, at some point during the series. Um, but, you know, to me, one of the reasons I shoot aperture priority is because that is kind of forcing the camera, if you will, to shoot the fastest uh, shutter speed possible under the correct under the uh, current situation, right? Because if yep. I'm shooting at wide open uh, with a wide open aperture, like say five six at a particular ISO, the camera is going to make that shutter speed be as fast as possible for the available light. Now, uh -huh. um, you know, some of the cameras now, a lot, most of the cameras now have this the ability to follow that one over rule, and for you to make adjustments on the camera to follow that one over rule. And uh, maybe that's something that we've got to make sure that we cover on how to set that or one of the ways to set that, if you will, on a future episode when we get a little more technical. Exactly. But, you know, just, just always keep that one over the focal length rule in mind. You know, if you're shooting a shorter lens, yeah, you can get away with um, shutter speeds that are a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, if you're shooting a really long lens, you got to have those really fast shutter speeds in order to ensure that you're not uh, blurring things as you hold that camera. You know, and it's funny because you, you did you did talk about, you know, if you're hand holding versus, you know, image stabilization versus being on a tripod. Some people think, well, you know, I'm on a long lens and it's on a tripod. I can shoot really slow. <laughs> um, and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily the case because especially with long lenses, long lenses kind of kind of lever quite a bit on a on a on a tripod and the yep. vibrations travel on that tripod. If if you're for example, let's say for example, you have your camera set up on a tripod on the side of the road and you have a vehicle go by, you'd be amazed how much of that vibration travels through the pavement up the tripod legs onto the lens itself and you'll get the high frequency vibration which is one of the worst kinds of vibrations you can have um, oh, yeah. you know it's the biggest enemy of sharp images so even when you're on that tripod you want to as much as you can follow that one over rule again there are situations where you're you're not following or you're violating the one over rule but you're, you know, hopefully you're doing that on purpose and you understand exactly why you're doing that and you're taking steps to, um, to, to ensure that you're still getting sharp images when you're not following that one over rule. Yeah. And what I would say is a good, good rule of thumb for me is if I'm shooting a telephoto lens on a tripod and I have the image stabilization or vibration reduction turned on and I'm kind of hand firing those shots, the slowest I feel comfortable going is 1 30th of a second. Mm-hmm. If well, I there's that dropping, deadly zone, right? I mean, we've talked about that before, That dead, what I call the deadly zone. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah. There is. Uh, once you start dropping below 1 30th of a second, especially when you're using a DSLR camera, you start running into the zone where the mirror, when it flips up to t uh, right before you take the shot, it can cause a little bit of vibration that can start blurring your shots. And the other thing, too, is the image stabilization. It stops working well once you start getting slower than that 1 30th of a second. And it can perform very erratically. You never quite know how well it's going to do for you, especially with these telephoto lenses. And so if I'm on shooting on a tripod, the slowest I feel comfortable going when I'm just hand firing is that 1 30th of a second. If I'm going to go slower than that, then that's where I start turning off the image stabilization. I lock the mirror up if I'm using a DSLR. If I'm using mirrorless, of course, it won't matter. And then I'll start using like a remote cord to trigger the camera or a two or five second delay on the camera. And so you have to use very different techniques once you start going much slower than that uh, one thirtieth of a second. Yeah, and then and then once you get past that, uh, you know, a tenth of a second or half a second, uh, actually probably even more like half a second, then you can start not worrying as much about, you know, that mirror slap, for example, with DSLRs, mm -hmm. right? Because your exposure is long enough such that the that little vibration that may have happened at the beginning doesn't have a great an effect on the image. Um, so there is that sort of narrow gap in there, that danger zone, you know, which is probably between half a second to a thirtieth of a second where you really need to be careful. 
Yes, but anyways, exactly. that's, you know, that's kind of digressing a little bit from what we're trying to get at here with wildlife photography and, um, and uh, uh, shutter speed. So what about, do um, you want to talk a little bit about panning, you know, and uh, slowing down the motion a little bit when you're, when you're shooting for wildlife? Why don't, you t- why don't you talk about that? Yeah, and I'll show you some image examples of that in just a little bit. But, you know, if I'm really trying to show motion and get kind of some motion into the shot, then I will use a shutter speed anywhere from about 1 30th of a second up to about 1 50th of a second. Now, if I want kind of that dreamy look or that partially blurred look, let's say I have a subject that's moving, I don't want the action to be perfectly sharp, I still want a little bit of movement to show through, then I'll be anywhere from about 1 100th of a second up to about 1 400th of a second. Now, if I want the sharp action, then I need to be like that one five hundredth of a second up to about one eight hundredth of a second for larger animals. And if I have like a smaller subject, especially if I'm getting close to them, that subject, then I need to be even faster. One eight hundredth of a second up to like one twelve fiftieth of a second. And for the fastest action sequences, then I need to be one sixteen hundredth of a second or faster. Those are, you know, that's a perfect setting for things like birds in flight or like a bear chasing a fish up a creek, and I want every one of those water droplets to be tack sharp. You know, for those birds in flight, though, I would say one sixteen hundredth of a second is a bare minimum. Um, you want to, you know, and again, it depends also what kind of bird we're talking about. A hummingbird, for example, you're going to want way faster than that if you want to get those wings nice and sharp, now, which is not necessarily what you know I like to do. Um, I oftentimes like to have some motion in the wings, but even for larger birds, like say, for example, an eagle, um, you know, a 1600th of a second will give you nice sharp eagle nice sharp wings except the tip of the wings will be a little blurry now you know and i think we've talked about this before in a previous episode that i like to have that little blur on the tip of the wings but a lot of people love to have those those wings tack tack sharp if you want those wings tack tack sharp you're going to want to shoot at even faster we're talking about one you know 25 hundredth of a second for example just recently here in, I live in Maine, so here in Maine, we have, right now, there's all these migrating fish coming up the rivers. Um, you know, these are called elvers, and there's tons, I mean, literally hundreds of thousands. I have a river just two blocks from my house, and there's chalk full of elvers coming in. And I'm not kidding when I say hundreds of thousands of these uh, fish. So what happens is right now, all the ospreys are coming in just hot and fast, coming in to catch the fish on the water. And they're coming in super fast into the water um, and they're splashing water everywhere and it's just a really cool you know a fast action uh, opportunity to shoot but in order to get everything nice and sharp including that water splashing we want to be at about 2500th hundredth of a second the 1600th of a second yes the bird the body of the bird and the head may be sharp but you're going to start losing some of that sharpness on the water and on the wings Yes, exactly. So let me kind of jump into a few examples here of shutter speeds and how it relates with wildlife photography. So this shot I took uh, years ago, and it was right before sunrise. The light was pretty low, and we had this awesome bear sighting right off the side of the road. Now, because the light was so low, I had to raise my ISO clear up to ISO 2000. My aperture was wide open, as far as wide open as it could be for this lens. And even still, the fastest shutter speed I could get was 1 one hundredth of a second. So what did I do? Well, I braced myself against the windowsill of the vehicle. And I just stabilized myself as best as I could, and then I waited for the moment. You know, while the bear's head was down in this grass eating, that was obviously not a good time to shoot. But once the bear kind of lifted its head up and looked off in the distance, it was holding still enough. I fired off a round of shots, and those shots were nice and sharp. So yes, you can use those slower shutter speeds, and sometimes you're forced to just because the light is so low. But so now you know, let me what, ask you. Let me ask you a couple of questions because yeah. you, you, there are a couple of things you talked about there. One was um, that you um, 
uh, you, you leaned yourself against the vehicle. First off, I, you turned the vehicle off, right? <laughs> oh, yes. You always want to turn that engine off because if you have right. that little rumble going on and you're leaning against it, well, guess what? It's going, going right into your shot. Right, right. And, you know, and, but again, it's amazing how sometimes people forget, forget to do that. And then the uh, second thing that I, that I wanted to make sure that um, you mentioned was that uh, uh, when you were shooting that, when you're shooting hand, you were shooting handheld, right? Yes. Leaning against uh-huh. a vehicle, you shot a stream of images, right? Yes. Um, so exactly. that you would get one image that would be sharp out of that bunch. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and that's the thing is you never want to just uh, have it be a one-shot wonder. You know, if you put that camera into continuous drive mode, while you're holding that shutter button down, there's going to be a period within that where you're going to have the camera be at maximum stability. Oftentimes when people press that shutter button, they're moving the camera at the time they're pressing the shutter button. And so if you press the shutter button and hold, now the camera is going to be much more stable throughout that shot sequence. Right. And this is especially true when you're shooting with the SLRs, right? And that because of that, um, of that mirror moving up and down, that's introducing vibration into the camera. And you may not be in that danger zone that we talked about earlier, 30th of a second, but every little bit of vibration that you have within your system is going to affect your image quality. So by shooting a bunch of images, what happens is that, you know, at some point those vibrations, if you're lucky, will cancel each other out and you'll get one of those frames out of maybe 10 or 20 that you shot in that rapid fire succession one of those frames will be nice and sharp um and if, if you mind if you don't mind david i want to show here a quick image of something exactly like that um give me the switch in here to switch over to my screen and let's me move to the correct image okay so this image if you look at the settings here this is a 40th of a second i shot this handheld with a um um, uh, a 500 millimeter lens at 640, uh, uh, ISO 640. This was under heavy canopy on an overcast day, and I was following this fisher around. And as you know, fishers are kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of hyperactive. They move around quite a bit, and I had to follow him. And the only way I was able to get one sharp shot out of that sequence, and I shot a bunch of images, and only one or two were sharp, is by holding that shutter down and shooting at that, uh, you know, uh, a, a, f- a rapid frame rate, as rapid as I could. Now, that doesn't mean that I was shooting at, um, you know, 20 frames a second. I think this camera could only do five frames a second or something like that when I <laughs> shot this image. But just the fact that I was holding that shutter down and I shot probably six, seven, eight images, one of those ended up being nice and sharp. And just as soon as that little string of images, you know, took place, that fisher ran, ran away and I didn't see it again. So, yep. yeah, it was a little bit of a luck. It, there was some luck involved in that, but you kind of make your own luck, right, by being prepared and knowing that you have to press that shutter down and make as many images as you can when you're hand-holding with a big lens like that to try to get at least one sharp image. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And whenever I'm shooting telephoto lenses, even with landscapes, I will take multiple shots just because you don't know what might happen. What if the wind blows while you're taking the shot? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, if you only took one shot, well, now you don't have anything to go back on. Right. But and, yeah. you know, the, and this used to be a case when we were shooting film, right? And every time you press that shutter, it costs 25 cents. But nowadays, you know, every shot is, you know, the only the only thing you run into is using up your batteries or using up space on your cards. But, you know, that's easy to remedy. You just carry oh, yeah. one more battery and a couple, one more card. Exactly. Well, let me show you an exa- another example here where it didn't work quite so well. Uh, this is one of my old, another one of my older shots, and I shot this with kind of a older technology crop sensor camera. And this was done at ISO 1600. Of course, the light's low, as you see. It's after sunset. The moon is coming out. And it's kind of amazing to me just to see how much noise I would get on these older cameras at ISO 1600 that I would never wow, get with yeah. the more modern <laughs> sensor technology. But I was on a boat, and the boat was rocking in the waves. And I thought, you know what? I can go one stop below the hand holding minimum and let the, uh, the image stabilizer help me out here. 
because knowing my camera at the time, I didn't want to go above ISO 1600. You know, my aperture is as wide open as it can go. And I shot this at 1 200th of a second with a 400 millimeter lens. But when I looked at my shots after we got back to the hotel that night, I was really bummed that my shots were not sharp. And it's because of the boat was moving so much, I didn't have anything to brace myself against. And I needed to have that faster shutter speed in order to render this shot acceptably sharp. You know, yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. You know, one of the things that you or challenges that you have in a situation like that also um, is, you know, your uh, if your boat is moving, is your autofocus, right? Because the, in a situation like this where the light is so low and the contrast is so low, your autofocus may have a little bit of difficulty grabbing onto that face. So oftentimes oh. you have to find a different part of the subject to for that focus to hold on to, right? And you can see here that that's indeed what happened. You know, my autofocus hit this part of the bear and right. trying to get it to move over to this part of the bear just was not happening with as much as that boat was rocking me around. You know, you think that, you know, the motion on the boat wasn't that bad, but when you start looking through a telephoto lens at extreme magnification, it's amplified. Yes. And yeah, it absolutely. It becomes so much harder to deal with. You know, that focus point that you had set right here can easily move over to here. Yeah. Yeah. So there's I, lots I of challenges associated with it. But, yeah, you I mean, know, when I, you have. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. You, you know, when you have the light, then, yeah, it's easy to get those fast shutter speeds. Like here, you know, this is by um, nine o'clock in the morning. You know, the sun's been up for a little while and it's really easy to get that one twelve hundredth of a second in shutter speed. All the snowflakes flying off these bears, you know, is nice and sharp and everything is good. But when you're, when you're in these low light situations, that's where the challenge comes in, you know, is how slow can you go to, to make it acceptable? And I would say just to be on that safe side, um, it's always better to try to be at that one over the focal length you're shooting. And if you're on something like a rocking boat, you may even have to go faster than that. Well, you know, it's funny that uh, you're, you made a good point there because, you know, even, you know, you said earlier that today's cameras do give you a lot more, uh, a lot cleaner images, right, at high RSOs. Oh, so much but, cleaner. But at the same time, you know, my philosophy is I'd rather have a grainy image than a no image, you know, yes. or an image that's you know, out of focus or an image that has blurred that's, that's messing it up. So, yes. you know, all things being considered, I would rather push that ISO up, especially with today. We have tools like we talked about in an earlier episode, um, uh, uh, Denoise from Topaz, Denoise AI, right, which makes an, does an incredible job at removing noise of images. As a matter of fact, I've gone back to some older images of mine that I really loved that um, had high, high uh, uh, noise levels because I was shooting at high ISOs, and I've been able to clean them up beautifully. So something to consider, you know, oh, yeah. keeping that one over rule, you know, all things being considered is always the best policy. For sure. So let me just show you an example here. This is a more recent image. And I shot this at 400 millimeters and I used the hand holdable minimum of one four hundredth of a second. Uh, these, I saw these really cool mop mop birds flying through the jungle. And it's of course a pretty dark forest canopy. And so I raised the ISO up to ISO 4000 in order to get that one four hundredth of a second shutter speed. But you can see here how just how clean the detail is and how sharp everything can be. You know, yeah, the ISO was high. There, you can see some um, high, uh, higher ISO noise here, like if you really zoom in and take a look at it. But overall, you know, the image is very clean. And well, yeah, I mean, that, that, and let me show an example here, too, because this is, you, you, this is a great example of what you're talking about. Um, if we look at... Um, I want to show you guys here real quick. I'm trying to s switch my my uh, my view over here for you guys to be able to see that. This image of this kingfisher in um, Costa Rica, this was in the middle of the jungle, just like you were talking about earlier. And if you look at the ISO, I'm shooting this at 12,800 ISO. 
something wow. that would be completely unheard of as something nobody you know, we wouldn't have done that long ago now if you look at this image you can see how clean that background is on this image it's just incredibly clean now part of that is because i applied the noise to this image afterwards right um mm -hmm. but part of it is because you know the clean sensors the clean images that these modern sensors produce as well absolutely so yeah let me kind of uh, go over a couple more examples here i have you know one of my favorite subjects to shoot are these little burrowing owls and this depending on what they are doing will di dictate the shutter speed that you use so you know a lot of times they'll just kind of sit there on a fence post or on the ground and just kind of give you the stare down and when they're <laughs> kind of in that more stationary or static pose yeah i can use the hand holdable minimum shoot a little lower ISO and get the better quality out of the, out of the image. So this one was shot at one five hundredth of a second. And, but if we have a more dynamic situation, such as this owl that's just about ready to, to fly away. Um, I shot this, you know, the light was getting lower uh, because it was just before sunset. It was that very last light that kind of came in and just hit the owl. I shot this at 1 640th of a second because my ISO was already pushed pretty high. You know, I think I was around ISO 2000 for this shot. But I ended up liking this image because it, con it conveys a sense of dynamism. Yeah, this wing that's getting ready to take off, it's not sharp. It shows motion. It shows some blur. But because it shows that motion blur, it also conveys a sense of dynamic motion in the image. And as well me, as depth as well, right? As depth, yeah, exactly. I don't think I would have liked the shot as much if everything was perfectly sharp and I had shot this at one two thousandth of a second in shutter speed. Now, if we get these guys in flight, yeah, it's entirely different ball game. You know, here it is, some harsh midday light, and I shot this at uh, one sixteen hundredth of a second. And as Juan was saying earlier. One sixteen hundredth of a second for these fast moving birds in flight, that may not be enough to to stop the stop the motion. And you can see here that was the case. I would have had to have been uh, probably at one twenty or twenty five hundredth of a second in order to render this sharp. Yeah, I mean right here that the, you're right. This is a perfect example in that uh, but you know i do like that movement in the wings maybe i would have preferred a tiny bit less but it still works i think i would have preferred this than having completely sharp completely still images because to me you know images like that just the bird the birds just appear to be hovering in the sky <laughs> which is yeah. kind of weird um yeah i'd like to have a little bit of that sense of motion now it's a little different when a bird is gliding um yes you know having kind of you know when the wing position is such that it doesn't convey a sense of motion having those wings perfectly sharp kind of works and i, I want to show here um two quick examples of that um this is a, a snowy owl again it's gliding and you can see that those wings are wingtips even the wingtips are just absolutely tack tack sharp and that's because if you look at the settings here this was shot at 3200th of a second now my iso is pretty high i'm shooting at, at 1600 um, which you know i guess by today's standards is not that high this was a number of years ago um but being able to have those wings nice tack sharp when the wings are in this position it kind of makes um makes more sense if we look at um this other one of another snowy owl same thing here the wings are in a static pose so shooting at high um, shutter speeds like 2500th of a second works here um, very well. Yep. And I would totally agree with that. You know, when the bird's in like that gliding pose or like if you have a bald eagle that's coming in for the landing. Yeah, like, like the one that you're showing right, right now. Here, yeah. Yeah, then it works. It works very nice, nicely to kind of render those wings and the wing tips, you know, perfectly sharp by using that really fast shutter speed like that 1 1600th of a second. Now, with larger animals like bighorn sheep, bears, and stuff like that, they're not going to be moving as fast as these smaller birds can move. 
so you can get away with shutter speeds that aren't as fast. Now, when bighorn sheep are in rut and they butt heads, it's a very, very fast action sequence. Um, if you're watching this, uh, you could actually watch the sheep and they can butt heads so fast that uh, you might only hear the sound. It's really hard to actually see the action. And so you have to shoot at a very fast frame rate. And even still, you know, I was able to uh, kind of capture them sharp enough in this lower light at one one thousandth of a second to, to make the shot work. Yeah, I mean, and you're absolutely right. When these guys kind of go at each other, it is absolutely split second. You can, you know, and this is where it pays off to understand and learn about your subjects. You can actually tell when these guys are about to butt heads with each other because they kind of rise up on their hind legs and kind of uh, rear up as they're coming in into into do um into do battle um here's a similar Im image to yours of, of two big horn sheep going at each other and this i was able to capture exactly the moment when they hit each other um and um and the only reason i was able to do this is because you know i had the fa fast shutter speed this is four thousandths of a second but also because as we talked about earlier i'm using a um the continuous um mode so my camera is at high speed frame rate which in this case i believe this is a 5d mark three which was what five frames a second or something like that um yeah i think at so. the fastest it's actually not very fast so you kind of have to you know get a little lucky but also understand your subjects to be able to capture that peak of action absolutely so let me kind of give you some examples where slower shutter speeds can work with wildlife um, so this shot I took while I was out with some clients at, at White Pocket down in Arizona, not a place you normally associate with wildlife. So we had this amazing sunset going on. We're, uh, photographing at our base ISO, ISO 100, uh, getting good depth of field for the landscape at F10, F11. And I hear this noise behind me and I turn around and I see this cow walking down the, <laughs> the slick rock towards us. I'm like, Oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> and so I told my clients, hey, look at this. Turn around. We got a cow behind us. So we turn around and the cow just kind of stands there and just kind of just stares at us. It's holding really still. And so I just took my base ISO exposure. I was on a tripod. This is a half a second exposure. And you know what? The cow held still enough that it's good and sharp. And I verified that on my back of my camera screen. I zoomed in and I made sure that the cow was sharp. And since it was, I didn't need to change anything. Now, if the cow was still kind of moving around and stuff, then I would have had to have upped my ISO and maybe opened up the aperture more, like maybe F71 or so, to bring in more light to have been able to make the shot work. So, you know, if your subject is holding relatively still, yeah, you can get away with shutter speeds as long as like half a second but you have to make sure the camera is stabilized on a tripod. Yeah, no, an you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're, you know, and, and that's in a way, a lot, in a lot of ways, a lucky shot as well, right? Because mm -hmm. it was a slow moving subject. Had it been, let's say, for example, a, uh, and I'm not sure what kind of wildlife you encounter there, but let's say it was, a, a, you know, a cottontail, um, cottontail rabbit or a white hare of some kind, they typically are not animals to stand still. They move quite fast, right? In a situation like yeah. that, you would have had to have a much faster shutter speed in order to be able to capture them correctly. Oh, for sure. Like if it was a coyote walking across the slick rock, well, good luck. Yeah, I would have had to probably gone ISO 3200 in this lower light to have been able to capture them. So here's an example of some bighorn sheep. This is after sunset, you know, the moon is rising. And I thought, you know, it might be really cool if I can get these sheep with the moon. And I found a couple sheep that seemed like they were holding pretty still. And so I was on a tripod. I raised my ISO to like uh, ISO 800 or 1000, I believe. And I took the shot at one sixth of a second. And because I was on the tripod, I could get away with that. You know, of course, I'm using the good techniques there. You know, I'm not just hand firing with my hand. You know, I'm using like a remote cord. I'm not relying on my image stabilizer to stabilize things. There was no wind this night. It totally would work. And as you can see here, even at one sixth of a second, 
these sheep are nice and sharp, you know, they held still. But I had to take a number of shots too in order to achieve that result. So I'm not just shooting a single shot here. I'm just using that remote cord. I'm firing off a bunch of shots, hoping that one out of the 10 will work. Yeah, I mean, that um, again, you know, the, the species here makes a difference, right? We know that bighorn sheep, they can be like statues sometimes. They won't move an inch um, uh-huh. or even a hair, if you will. Uh, when they're standing still. Yeah. So that, that worked out really nicely for you. I, lo- I love that image. That image is absolutely stunning. I love the, uh, I mean, you all the elements just came together for you perfectly there. That moon in the background, the um, the sheep in the foreground, the, the, the grasses even. I mean, there's nothing of this image that I would, you know, that I can find fault with. It's absolutely perfect. Oh, well, thank you so much, Juan. Really appreciate that. Oh, that's awesome. I really, really, really love it. Oh, thanks. Uh, Here's another example of a longer shutter speed with wildlife. And so these bears, you know, they were fishing in the river for salmon. And what they'll do is they'll stand on the side here and they'll kind of have their head down towards the water and they'll turn their head side to side scanning for fish that are swimming by. Now, when they're standing here, from far away, it looks like they're holding still, but when you kind of zoom in on them, you realize that they never really do hold still. But it's part of my artistic vision for this shot. I wanted to get like a slow shutter speed for the water to kind of convey that motion and that silky effect. But I knew that it would be really tough to get the bear perfectly sharp in that same sequence. So what I did is, you know, if I was shooting this as a landscape shot, I would have been at like a half a second shutter speed. Maybe the shortest I would have gone is about a quarter second in shutter speed. But I know that there's no way this bear would hold still enough for those kind of shutter speeds to work. So I went to one sixth of a second in shutter speed, which is still enough to kind of get that silky flow of the water. But it was enough to also, you know, I once again, you know, I took probably 20 shots here that one of those 20 shots was sharp enough on the bear that it actually worked. So don't be afraid to experiment with, you know, longer shutter speeds with wildlife. You just have to bear in mind what the constraints are of the scene and the species that you are shooting. Yeah, you know, the other thing that, oh, go ahead, keep going. Yeah, and so, you know, this is from that exact same day. You know, this is... um, You know, I stopped the lens way down. I was probably like at F22 here just to uh, let in as little as light as I could, ISO 100 or maybe even ISO 50. But then, you know, when I've got bears that are grabbing fish out of the water and the mood I want to convey is one of action and uh, in kind of that sharp uh, rendering, then yeah, I I have to shoot higher ISO. I have to open up my lens aperture more. And for this shot, I was at one eight hundredth of a second. And you can see now, you know, the water droplets are much sharper. I didn't want to go so fast that you don't see any of this dynamic motion in the water droplets. I still wanted some dynamic movement. Very nice. I like that a lot. Um, you know, we talked, we've talked a lot about shutter speed and how, you know, we need to understand what we're wanting to create in an image um, and how we are going to pick the correct shutter speed for that, right? And a lot of it is, like we talked earlier, thinking about, um, not, not thinking about this while we're, when we have our subjects in front of us. What we really want to be thinking about is what kind of image we want to create and then yes. let our bodies, if you will, automatically translate that onto the settings on the camera. If you have to think about, well, do I need to, I want to frame the, freeze the wings and get that motion. You know, by the time you start making those calculations in your head, whatever was happening in front of you is gone because wildlife just doesn't wait for you. Um, Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, you know, we're out there kind of, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I need to make sure I have enough depth of field. I need to make sure that I have, you know, capture the right moment. So what is the the combination of exposure of uh, shutter speed and aperture that I need to come up with in order to get the correct image. And that happens, you know, kind of like instantly without you really thinking about it. Um, So the other aspect of it, right, is we've talked a lot about shutter speed, but the other aspect of it, or the second leg, 
if you will, of the exposure triangle is aperture, right? Is, uh-huh. you know, what kind of aperture should we be using in these certain situations? And, you know, one of the reasons that I think in terms of aperture more so than I think in terms of um, shutter speed is because to me, aperture um, gives me, uh, for the type of images that I make, gives me more, uh, you know, lets me express my creativity more or create the images that I envision in my head more so. Um, in most cases, I'm trying to let my shutter speed go as high as it can to make sure I have a nice um, uh, uh, static subject, if you will, or not static subject, sharp subject. Um, yes, there are situations like what you were showing where you want to use uh, a slow shutter speed as an artistic means of expressing what you were seeing when you were there. But I think for me, most of the time, aperture is what I use to express that, uh, you know, my vision. Now, for wildlife, oftentimes we're always using or almost always using long lenses, right? Not always, but almost always. And we're shooting, you know, at 400, 500, 600, or even longer uh, uh, focal lengths. And, you know, the number one question that I get, and I w- I'm curious if you get this question as often as I do, is people say, you know, when you're shooting with those long lenses, are you shooting at f8 or f16? What kind of um, uh, aperture you're using? And I'm telling people, no, I'm shooting those lenses typically wide open. Do you do you encounter that often? Yeah, I get asked that quite a bit as well. And I would say yes, if I'm shooting a landscape and I don't have anything moving in my scene, absolutely, I'm going to stop that down and really just maximize that depth of field. But, you know, with wildlife, you typically don't have that luxury of everything holding still for you. And so it's often kind of amazed me in a way how much more depth of field I end up having after the fact than what I think I'll get when I'm shooting at like F5.6. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, you know, and I think that for a lot of people, the rules about depth of field can be a little confusing, Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, because people think, okay, I'm shooting a long lens, so my depth of field is going to be shallow. And that's true. A, a, you know, two lenses focusing on a subject at the same distance, the depth of field of the longer focal length lens is going to be shallower than a wider angle lens. Wide angle lenses have a deeper depth of field at a given distance. Um, But the other thing you got to think about that comes into the equation is the distance that you're shooting from, right? Mm-hmm. Depth of field also grows with distance. The further you are away from your subject, or the further you are away from the point of focus, the deeper the depth of field is going to be. So when you take those two things into consideration, you can oftentimes shoot with um, you know, very uh, uh, wide open apertures on your long lenses and have enough, enough depth of field. Um, so I want to give a couple of examples here of what that looks like. <clears throat> Let me uh, bring those up real quick here. And switch cameras. Oops. Okay, so here I have an image of uh, some musk ox in uh, just north of Nome in Alaska. And I am shooting at, if you look at the data here that I'm showing in Lightroom, I'm shooting at f5.6. So there are a couple of things that I was trying to do when I was making this image is I wanted to make sure I have, you know, I froze the action that was uh, taking place. These are large animals, so they don't necessarily move that fast in comparison to, um, you know, smaller animals like a rabbit or, or you know, or something of, of that nature. So I'm shooting at one uh 1,250th of a second, which will give me enough um, stopping power to actually capture the motion. But I'm shooting at f5.6. You know, having had a lot of experience shooting large animals like this, for example, in Yellowstone with bison, I know that at a distance that I'm at from these from these animals, because I'm keeping you know nice distance from them, I'm usually about 50 yards at least away from these animals. You know, f5.6 is going to give you enough depth of field to um, give me a sharp animal and maybe, you know, another one or two animals that are not too far away from this one animal. But even if I get a little bit of, um, 
uh, blurring, if you will, on the background subjects, that's okay because that will contribute to giving me that sense of depth of field into the image, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the, also the 5.6, what it's also going to give is a nice blurry background. So it makes my subject stand out some and brings them out and makes them pop out in the scene. <clears throat> Here's another example of two um, uh, muskocks kind of going into battle, if you will. They're not really battling at this point. They're kind of more... Um, uh, uh, training, if you will, for the upcoming uh, uh, rut season. Um, and these guys are very similar to bighorn sheep in that the way that they um, they fight each other is that they butt her heads very, very hard and very fast. And you can also be looking for the telltale signs that they're about to do this. Again, I'm shooting at f5.6, shooting at uh, with a 500 millimeter prime lens here. Um, and even f5.6, Look at the animal on the left. The animal on the left is kind of curved. So its rear end is a lot closer than its head. But still, I have enough depth of field to have everything in focus in the scene. So when you hear people talk about, um, you know, when I hear people ask me about what kind of depth of field do I need or what kind of aperture do I, I'm shooting at when I'm shooting my, my with my long lenses, I tell them I'm shooting wide open and they're always surprised. They're like, why? Aren't you getting enough depth of field? You have to take into consideration how far you are from your subjects. And these two ex, you know, quick examples show you how you know that holds true. As, far, as long as you're far away from your subjects, you can shoot those lenses wide open. And the other reason we want to shoot them wide open is something we've talked about earlier is, you know, we're oftentimes shooting early in the morning, late in the evenings, or when the light is a little softer. So guess what? There's not as much light. So we want that lens to be wide open because we want to capture as much of that light as possible so that we can raise our shutter speed, right? Yes, absolutely. And like you said, you know, the distance from you to the subject matters and also the distance between your subjects matter. Right. And many times, you know, I will want to, to have one of my wildlife subjects to be sharp and the other one to be kind of blurred out for an artistic effect. But there's other times where I don't want that and I want them to all be sharp. And so then I really have to pay attention to what aperture I'm going to use and considering how far apart they actually are. Uh, absolutely. And and not just, the, the you know, if you have multiple subjects, but if you have you know, a subject that you don't know exactly where they're going to be, you know, and I, this is a, the next example I want to show here. Um, this is a, a snowy owl that, um, you know, we were tracking it. We were kind of, you know, snowy owls oftentimes, a lot of owls, a lot of raptors, they kind of develop little habits and you can almost predict where they're going to be. And one of the things I wanted to do is try to capture this owl as it was flying over a field looking for mice um, you know, show a nice picturesque uh, background to it. But since I didn't know exactly how close or how far my subject was going to be from this fence that I have in the foreground, this split rail fence, what I did is, you know, I focused on the fence. Um, I then set my uh, aperture a little bit deeper. I shot it at, um, uh, at f8 to have a little bit more depth of field now i was shooting at only 200 millimeters so that also gave me more depth of field to the scene but you know my choice of f8 here was very deliberate and it was to provide me a little bit more leeway since i wasn't sure exactly where you know in relation to the scene the bird was going to be now i was tracking the bird as it was flying but still you know if you've ever shot snowy owls uh, during during snow you'll understand how hard it is for a camera especially you know this was in 2017 you know back then the autofocus systems weren't as good as they are today i know it's only been three years but it, they have come a long way in those three years um the autofocus system you know was having a hard time keeping track of this white subject with white snow flying all around so in order for me to give my camera a little bit of latitude a little bit more breathing room if you will to um, 
uh, uh, to to not you know to mess up if you will or not to lock on specifically to my subject shooting that f8 gave me that little bit of extra depth of field it also one of the things that it did it also got my my fence in focus um, but also gave me a little bit more definition on my background which is that that barn that's in the distance so it makes it more obvious as to what it is that uh, that is that is being shown in the image yeah, that's an awesome image. Thanks, Juan. <clears throat> so a couple more examples here. When you're thinking about um, uh, aperture, you know, the aperture, as we've talked to, you know, is, is you think about the basics of, of photography, right? We have all learned that the wider the aperture, the shallower the depth of field. It also, you get more light into the scene. Um, the smaller the aperture, the deeper the depth of field, but the side effect of that is that, you have less light coming in, so therefore your ISO needs to be higher or your shutter speed needs to be slower. And we're going to talk a little bit near the end here about the exposure um, triangle, but we're trying to always kind of balance all of those three things together. Um, so just a couple more examples here of things that I was trying to achieve with different apertures. So here's another another scene. This is a flamingo. I believe I shot this in uh, Galapagos a few years ago. Um, and you know, this as the scene unfold in front of me, I was shooting birds in flight. That's why if you look at my shutter speed, it was actually quite high. I had a pretty high ISO um, because my backgrounds were were kind of dark. Um, but I still wanted to capture you know uh, those birds in flight. And in this particular scene, when the flamingo kind of presented itself in the scene that we were shooting. Uh, I wanted to capture those ripples of that water, and I wanted to make sure that I had enough depth of field in this particular scene to be able to capture those ripples. And I played around a little bit with a smaller um, uh, uh, aperture to see if I needed to have a smaller aperture to get all those ripples nice and focused. But after a few different trials and shots, I realized at 5.6, I saw all that I needed um, to make sure that I did have those ripples nice and sharp while still having that background kind of recede out into a uh, you know kind of indistinct area one of the my signature on my images is really soft creamy out of focus backgrounds i love to i like to have those backgrounds that kind of recede into nothingness or that they uh, are very blurred out and they only provide as a backdrop but they don't detract from the view or from your subject themselves. I'm going to show you here another example of what I mean, a couple of, one or two more examples. Um, this is a, a hummingbird in Ecuador. It's a sylph. Re really amazing, beautiful hummingbirds because they have these humongously long tails that are completely iridescent, absolutely stunning birds. Um, and I position myself in such a way to include some, you know, somewhat distinct elements in the background, but I wanted those elements to be somewhat out of focus. And again, I was shooting at as wide open as I can with a 100, 400 millimeter lens in order to blur out that background. So again, when you're trying to compose an image and think of what you want to convey or what the, you know, how you want to compose an image, you know, thinking about you know, what that background, what that depth of field, how much depth in that, in that uh, depth of field you want is super crucial in translating that into the correct aperture. And one last image here, uh, this is a macro image, which makes it uh, uh, um, with typically naturally sh very shallow depth of field because you're shooting your subjects so up close. Um, and in this situation, even though I was shooting with a lens that can go up to f2.8, if I had shot this at f2.8, I literally, my, my depth of field would have been so razor thin that not even one of the eyes would have been in focus. I wanted to make sure that my background was, you know, completely blurred out and nice and creamy and soft, but still have enough depth of field to have at least one of the eyes nice, sharp in focus. So that's why I went down to f5.6. In this situation, my... Um, uh, my shutter speed, if you look at my shutter speed, is one one hundredth of a second, which is which follows the one over rule, right? Because I'm shooting at 90 millimeters. I'm completely handheld here. And to further sharpen my image, this lens and my camera both have image stabilization. 
So I know that in a situation like this, shooting at one hundredth of a second, I have a complete. I know I'm going to have a nice, sharp image as long as my subject is not moving, which in this case it wasn't. But maintaining that, you know, setting that that correct depth of field for the image you're trying to um, to achieve is just as important as the setting the correct shutter speed, right? Because that depth of field is one of the elements that we're going to use to craft the look of the image, not just the movement of your animal, but also how your animal relates with its environment. Absolutely. And so, you know, we talked about two very important variables that we have to define as photographers according to the shot that we envision. And that's aperture, where we set kind of control that depth of field and like how the background looks, um, how multiple groupings of animals are going to appear when they're, when, when they're together. And, and also we have to consider the shutter speed, which is that second variable. You know, do we want more of like a motion blur effect going into it? Do we want really sharp action? You know, what is our goal here? Maybe we want to take one of each. And so once we've defined what our aperture and our shutter speed is, the third variable that comes into play is ISO. And ISO typically is a variable that you're going to let float and go wherever it needs to go in order to accomplish your primary two objectives with aperture and shutter speed. Now, obviously, you know, it's, when the it's light interesting gets too because low, it's. It's a lot easier to do that now, right, David, than it used to be. It used to be that we had to set our ISOs and kind of live with them or change them on the fly quite a bit. But nowadays, we can yeah. use, you know, the auto ISO on the cameras. It makes our life a lot easier. Oh, it totally does. You know, if I was shooting with, like, my one of my older crop sensor cameras, like I was talking about before, I could not go above ISO 1600. But now with, like, my newer um, Sony mirrorless, you know, I don't have any problem really pushing that ISO high when I need it. So it's similar to your example in Costa Rica, Juan, where you shot it at ISO 12,800. Right. There's no way I would have done that four or five years ago. No, there's no, absolutely no way. <laughs> it would have been and boulders so, on that image, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would look so bad. Uh, so, yeah, Ron, if you can just switch over to my screen here, we can talk quickly about this exposure triangle to wrap up our yep. discussion. And so the three variables that define our exposure is ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. And by defining our exposure, that's uh, letting in the correct amount of light such that the highlights are not blowing out and the shadows aren't getting too dark. And we use our histograms to kind of determine where that exposure should be. And now we'll be covering that in more detail in future episodes. But assuming that we have the exposure where we want it, then any change in one of these three variables will necessitate a change in the other variable in order to maintain the same level of, uh, level of light coming in. So for example, let's say I'm shooting a fast shutter speed and I'm at 1 500th of a second. Well, let's say I realize I, I need to have an even faster shutter speed. Well, if I want to go to 1 1,000th of a second in shutter speed, well, I'm either going to have to open my aperture and let more light in, or I'm going to have to raise the ISO so that the camera is more sensitive to the light coming in. If I do one of those two things, then I can achieve that faster shutter speed. And so that's kind of how these things all relate. And, you know, we'll, we'll touch on this in more detail as we get more technical in a future episode. But basically, all of these are related by stops of light. And a stop of light is a relative term. It just means you're either doubling the amount of light coming in or you're having the amount of light coming in. So if I go from ISO 100 to ISO 200, all of a sudden the camera is twice as sensitive to light. Basically, it's the same as letting in twice as much light. If I go to aperture and I go from F4 and I go down to F5.6, well, now I've let in half as much light. And that's a reduction of one stop going from F4 to F5.6. With shutter speed, it's also easy to understand. If I'm at a 15 second shutter speed and I go to 30 seconds, well, now I've doubled the amount of light that I've let, let in. That's an increase of one stop. If I go from 15 seconds down seconds in shutter speed, now I've halved the amount of light coming in. That's a decrease of one stop. So as you get kind of used to thinking in terms of stops, it helps make the exposure triangle 
uh, make more intuitive sense to you. And if you if there's a specific shutter speed that you need, well, then it's easier to help for you to achieve that by either opening up the aperture or by increasing the ISO. Now, one of the tools that we will use as wildlife photographers is the auto ISO feature on our cameras. And I'll let Juan kind of finish up the discussion talking about auto ISO and some of the uh, ways that we can use that. So, yeah, I mean, the, a couple of things here, I think, and I'm going to leave this picture up while I'm talking. So my face will be kind of a little bit discombobulated in space. But um, so when you think about exposure, and you can see that exposure being the intersection of shutter speed, ISO, and f-stop. Exposure means that a certain amount of light is being gathered by the sensor, right? Um, and you can change the ISO or the um, shutter speed or the aperture and have a different combination of those three, th three settings and still have the same amount of light being captured. You know, for example, um, you know, a, an exposure, let's say, that is a, a specific set of settings with a specific set of depth of field and motion capture, you know, you can change that so that you have more stopping power with a smaller shutter speed and a wider aperture, meaning a less depth of field. And it's still the same exposure, it's just capturing a different scene. Um, and I think, you know, maybe worthwhile, David, at some point, maybe doing an episode exact on only about the exposure triangle and talking about the interrelationship between these three things. Because I think that's a subject that a lot of people, you know, maybe don't understand fully or they do understand, but they don't, you know, they kind of forget. So I think it's, it's, it's something that a lot of folks kind of fall um, a little bit on. And I think it's a good refresher and maybe give people different perspectives on it. Cause oftentimes learning different ways as to how to think about a particular subject captures different people's uh, attention. And I think Absolutely. it helps them remember more. So I think, it, I think it may be worthwhile doing an episode just on that. Um, yeah, I think that would be a great episode and because there's so many different ways to approach it, you know, whether from the wildlife standpoint or night photography standpoint or looking at landscapes. And you know, and there's the different color. analogies, right? A lot of different people use different analogies. Some people use water as an analogy. That's, a, that's an analogy that I like to use because for me it makes sense. But to other people, the water analogy doesn't make as much sense. So oftentimes it's good to have different analogies. Um, yeah. But anyway, so let's talk about auto ISO real quick. So auto ISO, um, what you know, this is something relatively, or it's been usable, re, you know, relatively recently. Um, auto ISO has been around for quite a bit, and what I, auto ISO uh, initially, when we started talking about digital cameras, you had to set the ISO on the camera, and the, and the ISO was kind of fixed on the cameras for that particular shooting that you were doing. You could then change it for another shot but you had to manually go in and change that ISO. And it used to be that you had to press a button and click on a wheel and whatnot to be able to change that. Um, and so it wasn't really easy to change when you were out in the field all that quickly. Um, well, I wouldn't say out in the field, but when you were in the middle of a shoot very quickly. Um, so is the light, if the light was changing, oftentimes the way you, um, you, you would approach it would be by changing your aperture or, or your shutter speed depending on what mode you were shooting on or you would change um, or, or you would do it using exposure compensation. Well, in, initially, one, some of the camera manufacturers came up with the concept of auto ISO where, for example, when you are in aperture priority mode, you're setting the aperture, the camera setting the, the, uh, the shutter speed auto ISO was also allowing the camera to set the ISO. So now the camera's controlling another variable. Before the cameras would only be able to control two variables, which was the aperture and the shutter speed. Now manufacturers provided the ability to also have the camera control or vary the ISO. But the problem with that was, as, as David has talked about, is that you know the high ISO settings on older um, digital cameras were not that great. So when you went past 1600, you know, your image quality degraded very, very fast. And if you're not paying attention, it was very easy for you to keep, you know, high 
uh, shutter speeds and small apertures, and then your ISO would go really high and you end up with images that were kind of really grainy, had a lot of noise to them. There was no way to easily control the ceiling or the floor of the ISO setting. More recently, camera manufacturers have allowed us to set a ceiling and a floor on the auto ISO. What does that mean? What that means is that um, you can set, for example, the maximum ISO that a camera will go to. So for example, my camera, my depending on where I am, but for example, the image that I showed earlier when in the jungles of Costa Rica, I was shooting, um, at my ISO, my maximum ISO is 12,800. So my camera will change my ISO up until 12,800. If it needs to go higher than that, it will not do that. What it'll do is it'll blink, alerting me that it's reached its ceiling. I can also set the floor. I'm not sure why you would ever do that because you want to go as low as possible in the ISO in no, most situations, but it's a setting that's there. So in most situations, my camera settings for auto ISO are a floor of 100, with a ceiling of um, 6,400, somewhere around there. Um, sometimes I'll expand that a little bit if I need to, if I, like I said, like if I'm in the jungle. And then I'll let the camera pick the ISO and I worry about the shutter speed and aperture and let the camera worry about the ISO because I really don't care so much as to where the ISO falls for a particular exposure. Um, so the, with this flexibility that camera manufacturers have given us, Auto ISO is an incredible tool that allows us to be more flexible, faster, and respond to changing conditions because it's one less thing that you have to think about and worry about. Just let the camera worry about it. Absolutely. And just, just to kind of make sure everyone's aware, the default mode for auto ISO is the one over the focal length rule. Right. So it'll give you a shutter speed that's at least one over your focal length or slightly faster. Now, there's other modes on some of these newer camera bodies where you can go in and set a minimum shutter speed for auto ISO. For example, let's say I'm shooting birds in flight. I could go on my Sony camera and set a minimum auto ISO shutter speed of one two thousandths of a second. So no matter how the light changes throughout that shooting session, it's always going to give me at least that shutter speed and dynamically change the ISO to match. It, and that's right. And different cameras do that differently. So something you, you have to look at in the settings on your camera on how to change that. Um, it, you know, Nikon's have it, Canon's have it, Sony's have it. I'm, I'm assuming some of the other cameras have it because it's now a pretty common common setting. But the way that you go about it is different. Um, so you got to look in the manual. But it's absolutely, you know, uh, uh, crucial. And I think that one of the times where, or one of the reasons why, for example, for me, shooting aperture priority is such a, uh, an advantage is because that is one of the times when the um, one over rule comes into play in relation with auto ISO. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. We don't want to spend too much more time on it on this episode. If it's something that a lot of you folks have questions about and it's confusing, you know, please let us know. We'd love to, you know, dedicate a large portion of an episode talking about that setting because I think that that is one of the most useful settings that we have nowadays on these cameras and makes us so much more flexible, much more responsive and quick, especially for wireless photography, being able to use auto ISO, aperture priority, and have the camera follow that one over rule. And in certain situations, allow you to adjust that one over rule. For example, sometimes because you're shooting birds that move quickly, you want to have uh, a shutter speed that's faster than the one over rule, right? Yes, for sure. No. Well, Juan, I thank you so much for uh, this great discussion on the foundational settings for wildlife photographer or photography, you know, talking about aperture, shutter speed, and lastly, ISO. And I hope to all of you watching that these ideas that we kind of threw out there and things to think about are helpful to you as you go out and practice and get ready to shoot wildlife out in the field. Folks, thank you for joining us and uh, make sure to get in touch with us either by joining us on our Facebook group at Images in Focus in uh, Facebook or by sending us an email. You can reach us at info at And until next time, take care, folks. 
Goodbye.